here on This Might Get Uncomfortable, one of the most favorite things that I love in discussing with guests are origin stories. Of course, we love to dig into the why and the how of our guests' success, their uniqueness, their talents, their loves, their passions, their heartbreaks, all of that. But the origin story for each one of us, I think, is such a unique thing. And prior to recording, uh, our guest Wade Lightheart was was asking. He was he was he was foaming at the mouth almost, just trying to figure out what the script in uh, in Whitney's office looked like. And uh, and we decoded it to say to entertain. And I, I made an offhanded comment that I studied hieroglyphs in middle school. And uh, and Whitney was kind of a little bit shocked by that. But indeed, the very first thing that I wanted to be when I was a child was a paleontologist and an archaeologist. And so I was studying ancient Egyptian culture and all kinds of interesting things. So as an aside, to get into the origin story of our esteemed guest, Brother Wade Lightheart. Wade, I, I feel like an unconventional way to start this podcast would be when, when you were a young boy, what was your idea, your vision for what you wanted to be when you grew up? Was it what did, did you expect you'd be doing what you do now, or was it something completely different? It's a great question, and there's an assumption that the origin story began in this lifetime, so that's an assumption in itself. But um, relative to incarnation in physical form, um, in this turnaround, I would say that I had a variety of things that I aspired to, and I can link think back to my my mom has one of those little albums you know, where they have all your report cards when you were five and six and you kind of check the boxes. This is like way, way back before phones and everything. So it's like this ancient, it's almost like scrolls or something that you're, it's like really ornate, but kind of cool because there's a tactile component to it now. And I believe at the bottom when I was five years old or six, six, I guess, when I went to school, maybe five, I wanted to be, uh, an astronaut, I wanted to be prime minister, and I wanted to be a professional athlete. So we've got one out of the three. My trip to Disneyland on the Millennium Falcon doesn't count as an astronaut, but boy, it felt awful close. Um, and then um, we'll work on prime minister after I'm done my business uh, career. So My question is prime minister of what country? Well, Am I'm I assuming the UK. Canada? No, I'm from Canada originally. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. why you're so kind. Not to overgeneralize and make assumptions about Canadians, but I have to say, all my Canadian friends are extremely polite, kind-hearted people, and as you are too, my brother. It's well, that's why I had to actually. I had to move to America because I I, I think the Canadians said that you're a little too American. You need you're a little bit more aggressive and robust and energized, and you know. I was always in trouble for talking. I always had this innate belief in my own abilities, despite no proof or evidence that I was going to be successful on any level. In fact, I voted for myself. It's kind of funny. I, 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 you're talking origin stories and things that people might not know. In high school, this is, this is kind of an interesting story and why I believe that no matter what you need to believe, bet on yourself regardless of the outcome. Because, I mean, that's the only thing that you can potentially control. But in high school, I was a bit of an outcast. Um, I lived in a very rural place. We'll get into that in a minute. But we had a, you know how you vote for all the things in high school? You know, like who's going to be the most likely to succeed and who's the best couple and what's the favorite music? And I swear to God, the people that ran it were just totally not taking in the real stuff because everything that was on that list was absolute trash. I couldn't believe that anybody voted for any of it. However... I remember doing my own votes and it came to, well, who do you think is most likely to succeed? And I voted for myself. And um, I came back to my house and uh, I was in a discussion with my parents and my parents had this kind of curious relationship with what I was doing in the barn for the last four years. Because from the time I was 15 till I went to university, I had built a gym in my barn and I was training and I was following the principles of Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, who wrote uh, Education of a Bodybuilder. And inside that, he had illustrated, you can achieve anything in life if you have a positive attitude, uh, self-discipline, and hard work. Well, 
everybody I knew worked really hard. It was a rural place, five miles to my nearest neighbor up a dirt road. I had to take a snowmobile out to the bus and an hour bus drive to school. So I literally had to go uphill both ways to get to school in the winter on myself and thrust into this world where I was isolated from my friends, my community, a lot of my schoolmates, and put into this whole point where I didn't have much time. I connected with people through books. Internet wasn't available at that time and reading autobiographies. And Arnold, of course, was one of the most successful and famous people on the planet. He won all these Mr. Universe contests and Mr. Olympias. And he was, you know, a famous actor and he was in all the movies I loved. And he had this Conan the Barbarian story that I watched every week because it was a Nietzschean kind of tale or this guy was like thrown into the wild and abandoned and he's forced to live by the wheel of pain and becomes king by his own hand by avenging his enemies. And, and, and you know, it's, it's an epic story that really launched his career in Hollywood. And these three things that he outlined of self-discipline, a positive attitude and hard work. And, and inside of that, he talked about developing self-confidence and self-confidence was developed through a practice where you got incrementally better. And over the course of these four years, I'm out there in the barn. Sometimes it's 30, 40 below. My hands are freezing to the bar. And I'm just in the mindset and I'm training in a snowmobile suit. And of course I wouldn't wear gloves because Arnold didn't wear gloves. So if my hands got ripped off from the skin, it didn't matter because that was just a badge of honor. And my hands had become so callous from manual labor and the work I was in. I just saw myself as this barbarian kind of crazy guy that, that, that voted for himself as success with, there's no evidence that I'm going to be successful in anything. And I've picked a sport that I have no capability or abilities in, but I'm like, you know, if Arnold says this and every week I would say to my parents, they go, why, are, why, why, what are you doing out? Like, what are you doing? I said, you don't understand. One day I'm going to compete in the Mr. Universe. I'm going to live in Venice Beach, California and trade at Gold's Gym with Arnold. And I'm going to own a supplement company that is going to sell products all around the world. And I'm going to write books and tell stories about what I'm doing right now. And it's 33 years later from when I started that journey and it all happened. That's really exciting. And gosh, there's so many directions to go from there. I guess actually, first and foremost, not to make this feel like a product placement, but I'm legitimately curious because Jason and I have been taking your your supplements for a while. Um, I sat down at my desk. What I do is I put my supplements in areas where I'll remember to take them based on what I'm going to be at each time. That's because otherwise I, I will have like a collection of supplements sitting around and never take them. So my new hack is like, all right, if I place them you know, on my desk or in the kitchen, like wherever I'm going to be so that I'll be cued visually to take them at the right time. I will, but it didn't work today because I haven't taken my, my Cognibiotics, Cognibiotics. Um, Oh, that, that reminds me of two questions. First of all, Jason and I were having a debate over how to pronounce bioptimizers. He thinks it's bio optimizers. I think it's bioptimizers. Which one of us is right? Great question. On first and foremost, <laughs> and then I, I have the, a question about these product. This product. First and foremost, I do the exact same thing for my supplements. So I'm, you're the first person I know that does that. So that's a kudos to. Second thing I noticed, there's a rebounder in your background. That's an, a, a daily aspect of my life. So we, we me are too. Just winning. Yes, and the, honestly, and, 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 game and the changer. Third piece, which is really ironic, and this is another story that a lot of people don't know about. When we originally formated, formed the company name, we rebranded it after Matt and I had a bodybuilding company and we kind of left that sport eventually and it, it fused into biological optimization. And we got into, because we've always been passionate about that. It was expressed in sports, but then went into health and high performance in other areas. And <laughs> the name biological optimization. So we wanted to shorten this up. And at the time we had another partner, Dave Rule, uh, who was part of the rebranding of the company. Cause Matt and I are not, we're not brand guys. We're not, we're just, we're, we're just health freaks, but he's really good at style and branding and was a big aspect of developing and cultivating the brand. And so we had went through a bunch of names and the name B I O P-T-N-I-Z-E-R-S. 
became the topic of debate. I wanted to call it bio-optimizers. Dave and Matt called it bio-optimizers, and I lost the vote two to one. However, when someone says it's bio-optimizers, I'm like, yay, yay. <laughs> it doesn't happen that long. So I don't care what anybody called them. You know, what I would rather people say actually is to be optimizers or to be optimized because that's essentially that's the mission of the company. And um, so the buy doesn't matter or the bio doesn't matter. It's are you being optimized? And I think that's really uh, important. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Um, even more questions for you. Well, first, because this might be a quick answer, which rebounder do you have and how do you use it and why do you use it? Because I'm really passionate about rebounding, increasingly so. And I actually have been using it more than ever during COVID because yeah. now I do all my workouts at home. And yeah. before it used to just kind of sit in the corner, but now I've actually started using it every single day as part of my daily workouts. And I, it makes me so happy because I love using it. Yeah, it's impossible to be happy if you're and unhappy if you're jumping on a rebounder or mini trampoline. It's it's like it, there's a biochemical reality that it will change your state. It's you know so whether it's Tony Robbins NLP, whether it's a lymphatic system movement, or the sheer stress that it creates on a cellular environment that activates certain positive chemical cascades. It's probably all of the above. But definitely jumping up and down a rebounder is probably one of the greatest things that anybody could do for their health long term. Um, I got introduced to the concept by a fellow by the name of David Hull, who um, built a company called the Seller Sizer, which is a steel-based machine that has a barrel spring that is, is not a barrel spring, it's a tapered spring, which has three different levels to handle medium, soft, medium, and intense and being a bit of an intense guy that has one on my roof and also one here in my office, um, I, I go pretty hard on that thing sometimes. So, so I have that. Um, I know there's a lot of people use the Rebound Air or the Bellicon, the Bellicon, which is a little bit higher machine with a softer bounce. So a lot of people like that inside of the house. And then some people will go with the steel springs if you're going for like some kind of crazy stuff like I might attempt. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to either one, and uh, you kind of just choose whatever works for you. Okay. When you when you say you go hard on a rebounder, Wade, I need some specific visualizations because when you say that, I imagine you are doing front flips, back flips, the splits off the drum riser like David Lee Roth circa 82. Like what? <laughs> what? When you say you go hard on the rebounder, man, what do you mean? Yeah, great question. Well... First, it would involve um, putting on a headset with Paul Oakenfold's Gate Crasher 1999 first. So I need to be super amped into some kind of like uh, ferociously activated uh, hard house trance thing. And it's going to take me about 30 to 45 minutes to get into that space. And, and that particular album um, is great because as you get in and about, and, and if you're familiar with Paul Oakenfold as a, as a, as a trance guy, he, he does some really, he's very sophisticated with his transitions and his buildups and stuff. And so he gets to this point where the whole thing kind of just comes undone and he just starts hitting these heavy bass beats. And by that time you, you, you've, you're switched over to fat burning, your neurochemistry is lined up. You've been going on this and you're past like the initial challenges that you would have in a physical thing. You're in this kind of euphoric state and then having activated from prodigious amounts of various chemicals back in that time, I, there, I think there's a neurological activation where I now have capabilities that I don't normally have. And that might involve just ferocious sprints, jumping up and down with a cable, like a, like a spring, like a cable, no, 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 what do you call it? Uh, one of those like X bars and doing presses and curls and jumps. And then from there, I would be doing kicks to the sides back and forth and, 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 then, and then doing just distance jumps, like see how high I can come out before I bottom out. And you got to spread your legs a little wider if you're doing that, because otherwise you'll bottom out in the center. So you're like, you're getting some major air. Like, you know, you're, you're coming off the ground pretty hard, pretty high and pretty fast. 
And, you know, my hands and, and feet will be flailing in a strange episode enough that um, I, I, I got into it when I first moved to Venice early on at like early in the morning. I, I got so charged up because I have this cool bio home. It's got four floors and I've a rooftop gym and everybody in the neighborhood knows me as the guy with the gym on his roof. But I got up early one morning and I started going crazy like this. I'm all charged up. I'm all enzymed up. I'm all nuded up, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm in this ferocious euphoric state. The sun's coming over the palm trees. I'm like, wow, I'm just feeling so amped. And the music kicks in. It, it was an accidental thing that it, something switched on my machine and this thing kicked in and I just started going and I got into this crazy state. And what I didn't realize, I was making so much noise before the time, that like the, the like the, like the, the, the sound, like it was early in the day. So you, you, there's like sound rules or something to the neighborhood that you can't make noise at certain times. And this guy on the street, he's staring up and I don't realize he's yelling at me. And at first I kind of think that he's cheering me on and he's excited. But then I realize, oh, something's going on here. And so I unplug my earphones and turns out he's like, hey, do, do you know it's like 6 a.m.? Like you're making a racket. This is not the voice thing. And I'm like, oh, hey, great to meet you, neighbor. Sorry. <laughs> so that was <laughs> so that's the problem. You know, there's there's problems when you start doing the things that I do that, that are unexpected. Maybe you're better suited for living uh, in like Vancouver or something off, off on some remote island. I did that. And that's where I developed all these strange tendencies because I didn't have to conform to group components. The problem was, is that got put into me early on. And so I think it's baked into the nervous system. You know, personality is pretty much cooked really early. And as I've told many of my ex-girlfriends, I'm like, yeah, you know, I've worked my whole life to work on the things that don't work that well. And I've got 80% of them off, but the other 20% is kind of the cake's kind of baked on that one. So if you can't deal with it, we should probably just be friends. Well, that leads me to my next question, which is um, why Venice? Because I don't know if this was mentioned before we began, but Jason and I both spent time living in Venice Beach and we total, totally get the culture. And sometimes I really miss living there. And recently Jason was sharing how Venice has changed a lot. And, and uh, actually, you could probably articulate this better because you sent me the article, Jason, about what's happening on the boardwalk. And um, it certainly goes through a lot of different phases as a part of Los Angeles. So I'm, I'm curious what the appeal is and how it's been feeling for you lately. I moved down. So <laughs> 33 years. It's my life dream to come here. I, I, I immigrate to the United States in maybe the most difficult period in the history of our two countries to immigrate to the United States. I go through all the legal standpoints. I go through all the financial requirements. I get my E2 visa. I get this house that's literally a block away from the original Gold's Gym place and just a little ways from the new Gold's Gym. And I'm going, oh my God, I've got my dream. And this of course is in January of last year. <laughs> I get one month with going to the gym in the morning. Arnold Schwarzenegger's next to me. I'm like, we've hit the dream. It's all great. COVID breaks out. I, we don't know what's going on. So I'm like, you know what? Oh, it's 20 million people here in the LA area. Food supply of maybe three days. Probably not a good place to be hanging out if chaos breaks out. Let's get out of town. So I go to Arizona for a period of a few months to kind of hang out in the desert. I got a researcher that works with us. She's got a great place. And I'm like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to hang out in the sun. We're going to, and it was certainly a lot more open over there. So I mitigated some of the lockdown. Cause I actually, what happened is I saw these two policemen walking through the back alley of my, by my house, plainclothes policemen. I could tell they were plainclothes policemen. And I was like, wait a second. These guys, obviously they're gritting out this place. Something's going down. I'm out of here. I threw all my stuff in the truck. I left two hours later, they locked down uh, two days later. So I come back, so Arizona, then I, I come back and you know they opened up the gym. So I said, my rule for coming back to Venice is they need to open up Gold's Gym. So I'm like, they announced that they've reopened Gold's Gym. I'm like, great, I'm coming back. I come back to Los Angeles. I go back to my neighborhood where I'm living in. It's destroyed. 
There is garbage from one end of the street to the other. There's homeless people strung out on drugs. This is right on Pacific Avenue, a block from the beach, not far from living libations and all that sort of stuff. It's like, you know, it's a cool little place. And it's, and uh, I, I'm literally, I'm, I'm up in my third floor. It was another three, that was a three-story building. I'm a four-story building now, but I'm in, I'm in this three-story building and I'm up here and I hear this screaming, some woman screaming out on the street. I run downstairs. I was just in my shorts out onto the street and there's some guy trying to trash uh, a, 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 some of oh, this, this Winnebago with a woman in it who's screaming bloody murder. And I'm like breaking up these fights between people and the police show up and guns are all drawn and I'm going, what's like, what's, what happened to my neighborhood? What happened to my dream? You know? And uh, I was like, well, we can't live here. And my, I was living with a friend of mine who's a copywriter. He's a mystic. Uh, he's got the highest recorded brain scores, I think, of anybody. He's a really smart guy. And we get along really well with the spiritual process. And he's like, hey, yeah, well, let's go walk in this old part of the neighborhood that I used to live at one night at 930. Like, this is after the day after this happens. And we wander on along the street. And he goes, we, we, we're on our way to Air One. You know, you go to Air One. He says, well, let's go wander through the neighborhood this way, randomly. And we walk by this place. And there's this, there's this beautiful four-story, pristine home. And we look at it and he's like, there's a guy downstairs. And I'm like, hey, what's this place? And he's like, oh, we just completed its building. I'm like, oh, really? You're like, what's the deal on it? And he's like, yeah, well, you want to come in and take a look? And I said, yeah. So we look at it and it's got this perfect studio in the bottom. And then it's got two great stories on the top. And then it's got this rooftop. And I'm like, this is everything that I wanted. And because of COVID, I was able to negotiate a, a, a way better price. It was kind of built for a startup company. So we moved over here and I started tricking out the biohome in the way that I want to trick it out. And, the, you know, because you got to live nowadays, it's all about optimizing your home environment because you can't necessarily count on going to the gym or the spa or the biohacking facility or whatever. So I said, I'm just going to build one right here myself. So it all worked out. So that happened. And eventually, um, my friend, he, he moved on. He fell in love with a wonderful lady and they're off on their relationship. So now I'm here in my castle all by myself as my contrarian self that has planted the flag for health and value and all of these things that we represent. And doggone it, I will defend this place to the last, to the, to, to, to the last bullet or sandbag or whatever the heck I've got to throw at him, a bottle of enzymes, I don't care. We're going to, we're going to stay here because uh, you got to plant the flag somewhere, but yeah, very devastating to the community here for sure. Um, it's a war zone down main street and Abbott Kinney. I'm just off of Abbott Kinney and the, the amount of businesses closed and things it's, it's really dire for certain, but you know, when there's blood in the streets, there's also opportunities. So you, you, you've got to be able to take the hits and keep moving forward no matter what. There's a lot of life lessons in, the wonderful stories that you're telling, Wade. And and first of all, you're a, you're a fantastic storyteller. Like I, I always feel just like everything you're sharing, I get drawn in a little bit deeper. Uh, and in your stories, you know, there, there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom you've been dropping. And I want to go back a few minutes because you were talking about your original inspiration when you started weightlifting in your snowmobiling suit in your barn where you grew up. And you were talking about incremental improvements. And I think one of the things that I've noticed, especially people in general, but I think especially young people, Whitney and I do a lot of social media consulting, social media marketing. We talk to a lot of different clients and people about leveraging social media to you know, create a, a heart-centered, authentic presence online. And one thing that I think I've noticed is that people feel, many people feel like they should be amazing at something after only doing it for like two or three weeks as an arbitrary measurement. Like I've been doing this thing. It's like, well, how long have you been doing it? I've been doing it like a month. Like why, why do you expect you would be world-class at something after only doing it for a month? So I, I plucked out that one nugget of many things you said of focusing on incremental improvements and using that as motivation to keep you going. And I think in some ways that that's a conversation that might be getting lost a little bit in our society right now where there's this expectation, probably fueled by social media and people posting you know, their, their, their highest achievements, people comparing themselves to those things, but feeling like they should be great at something for only doing it for a few weeks. 
And I think it's interesting you talked about that because it's so important to remember and acknowledge and celebrate the small improvements along the way instead of feeling like we have to be incredible at something, you know, after taking a weekend seminar. I agree 100%. Um, and I'm blessed because a couple things. One, I, I'm, I'm the last group of people, I think, the age generation that grew up without the internet. So I didn't have the internet. And I didn't have a cell phone. And it was long distance to call any of my friends, so that was out of the equation. It's an hour and a half to get to school. It's an hour and a half to get back. I'm left with a lot of time. I'm a 15-year-old boy when my life changed. My sister was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. She was four years my senior. I watched her go through the medical model before she died at the early age of 22. So, and during that time, I was left with the question as we would take her home 55 miles to the town where she'd get treatment. And we'd come home and we'd have to stop maybe five, six times on the way home for her to vomit after taking the treatment. And she'd be in excruciating pain for a number of days before she'd come back. And in my naive self, I went, wow, this doesn't seem like the, the treatment seems worse than the disease. What, well, what is health? And, you know, my parents were obsessed with what was going on. And we're in this rural environment. I, I can't run from it. I can't hide from it. I can't really bring friends over because of the consequences of, you know, the erratic behavior of someone who's going, undergoing cancer treatment, especially who is on a life-threatening illness. And it was, so inside of that, I had nothing to out, I had no outlets from that pressure cooker in a way. And I didn't have the normal upbringing. And now at the time I was, really angry and I was really frustrated about it. So I can hear when people are angry and frustrated because they're not where they want to be. And, and there should be a level of anger and frustration when you're not where they be. That's a motivating factor uh, that will leverage you. And it's, it's not one that will take you all the way to the end, but it certainly gets you out of uh, apathy and desire and fear. You know, anger can be a, a, a fuel uh, to get you up into the higher states of consciousness. But inside of that, when she gave me a bodybuilding magazine that had Troy Zuclato, Mr. California on the cover, two pretty girls. And there was this whole lifestyle in Venice Beach and these muscles. I didn't have muscles. I didn't have those girls. I didn't even have a gym. But it was enough to inspire me to a dream. And so with my money that I worked from my manual labor job, I built my gym in the barn. And I kept in mind this vision that I was going to have, which I just illustrated to you uh, earlier in the podcast. And what I just the, the the what was revealed to me by lifting weights is that if I lifted weights in a precise prescribed format that was advised, every now and then I I could do a couple more reps, or I could add more weight to the bar, and all of a sudden I built a habit of incremental process. And understand, and then my muscles would change a little bit. And then I would get a compliment. Someone would say, hey, your arms are getting bigger. Or, or I would play sports and I was stronger than the other kids, even though I was smaller. I would, there'd be people that would be maybe, you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds heavier than me. And I could hold them off with one arm in a, in a hockey game because I was training and they weren't. And so I started to get little tiny acknowledgements about something that was definitive. And then that was the beauty of what bodybuilding gave to me. And the sport of bodybuilding gets such a bad name because of its extreme level that happens and the cartoon effect and the unmitigated drug use. And I, I can certainly see why there, and, and the narcissistic uh, components that are often attributed to it. And those are all valid, I think, to a certain extent. But the pure essence of that, that I discovered in that barn and never lost sight of, and something that I think Arnold Schwarzenegger never lost sight of was the joy of incremental progress, the ability to do something today that you couldn't do last week or last year. And he said that that was the foundation for his success in everything that he ever did. And he's one of the most accomplished people on the planet. If you think of he was a world champion athlete by the age of 22, he was a millionaire in the 1960s by the time he was 28, he became the highest paid actor in the world 
by the time he was 40. And then he became governor of California by the time he was in his, his, his by 50. Those are, in any one of those areas are in, mega accomplishments in, a, in, a, in one person's lifetime. But he learned those principles. And if you look at people who've worked with him and practice with him, they all say the same thing. He always comes in with a positive attitude. He always comes in and works harder than everybody else that's on there that is going to do. And he has the discipline to do that which isn't that fun for long periods of time in sort of that he can become great at what he does. And I think those foundational components are something that's lost today when you hit a button and something shows up in 24 hours or three hours in Los Angeles from Amazon, um, where you get a dopamine hit because you got a like, or you got this, which is an artificially created reward system for something that doesn't really resonate as progress. So the unintended consequences of technological innovation is we've built false reward systems in our digital stuff that addicts us very much like a drug that provides a euphoric, distorted se sense of self. But we're getting that constantly broadcast to children on their iPads and their phones and in, in the in, in social media and in the internet. And, and then we also have expanded our natural tendency to compare ourselves to other people in the tribe because this is part of the hierarchy structure that is innate inside our biochemical reward system. So instantly you are going to be comparing yourself to someone who for whatever reason is radically far advantaged over you or ability or had the right environment or you don't know their backstory. There is a kind of a cut and paste kind of propagation of who this person is and how they got there and all that sort of stuff. And there's an, there's an insecurity that comes with that, that I'm not good enough. So inside of that, the way human social systems work is you're scrambling to establish yourself within the, what you perceive as the social hierarchy. So you're scrambling for anything because what's being threatened is your amygdala response that I'm going to be kicked out of the tribe. And that has expanded into digital tribalism, which is ruining the world where we're attacking everybody because it's like the ancient tribal warfare of like thousands of years ago. And so what, that's what's happened in, uh, with the unintended concept of social media. So we're going to figure that out. I don't know when, maybe it'll be a few generations, but uh, it's, it's a painful learning experience. Wade, I, I love that you talked about this concept and I think you were the first person a couple of years ago, this is an interesting memory. I remember watching, it was either a Facebook Live or an Instagram Live where you talked about the digital drug dealers. And I had never heard anyone put that phrase out into the lexicon. And I remember listening to you talk about, you know, the Kardashians and other social influencers and, and um, using outrage and sex and violence in comparison to basically... Um, increase their worth through the attention economy that, you know, attention now has become one of the most valuable non material assets in the world that he or she who commands the most attention is going to leverage more influence that way. And, and you went on this wonderful, it had to have been a couple of years ago, I remember now, and you went on this wonderful examination of, of the dangers of becoming addicted to what these digital drug dealers are pushing. This is something we talk about all the time here on the podcast in terms of reclaiming our mental health, our emotional wellness, our sense of agency, our sense of self-worth. Being that as it is, what are some things you could recommend to not only us, but the listeners of how to reclaim our sense of self-worth, how to wean ourselves or break that addiction and have ultimately a healthier relationship to our, our sense of self? but also how to use these technologies in a responsible and healthy way that don't make us feel worse. What would you recommend in that regard? It's a great question. Um, and I'm not a psychotherapist and I'm not super versed in psychopharmacology, although I am a certainly passive biohacker and interested in neurochemistry and uh, reward systems relative to learning and emotional mastery. And I've been a student of that my entire life because as an athlete and as a, eventually as a coach, and then as someone who leads a company, you need to understand these intrinsic systems in order to help people uh, develop reward-based systems that build um, confidence 
and that build capable or capabilities. So what we want is competence. Uh, so there's nothing that can't be overridden if you develop competency. And so rewards without competency is the problem. And so normally how our neurological feedback systems work, and so let's, to answer the question, we need to explain the mechanism that happens. So let's say the dopamine response system. Our brains have evolved over millions of years through a kind of a dopamine response system based on learning that you get a kind of a aha. Now, children who have gone through the education system and are identified as intelligent or smart track through a system that continually reinforces that they are smart relative to the curriculum and whatever the, the, that, that status is. And so, but most people don't fall within the educational curriculum that has been outlined by our education bodies because the education system was developed, you know, to create, to create workers for factories that don't exist anymore. So what happens is you have all these other people who now are identified as a B student, C student, D student, or a struggling student, or whatever it happens to be. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. It just means that they're not necessarily set out to be rewarded because they're not getting the dopamine reward system. So what do they do? They seek it out. So if you look at addiction, addiction usually, if you look at the history of people who become addicts to drugs or alcohol, oftentimes it happens in their teenage years when they get exposed to alcohol or drugs at that interactive stage when they're still developing uh, the consequence aspect of your brain, which isn't fully developed till I think you're 26, 27, 28, something in around that range. So what happens is they're not able to fully um, acknowledge the consequence of their indulgence in what I would call false neurochemical reward systems. In other words, they smoke this drug, they take this hit, they get that. Now we all are well versed that no one would leave the liquor cabinet open with their kids or a bunch of assorted drug paraphernalia around so the kids could get high while you're not home, right? No one would do that. But what we do is we're stuffing these digital dopamine uh, and neurochemical delivery systems with our two-year-olds. So most five-year-olds right now can operate an iPad better than I can. I I'll just say that straight up. They can search, they can operate. And what I came to conclude after a while is that they are actually living in the digital world. So how I feel when I enter into the digital world is how they feel when they're in what I call the real world. And so now we've created a, a, a bifurcated society where a great number of people are locked into a digital artificial realm with its own rules, its own regulations, and its own reward-based systems inside of that. Conversely, some of us old guys like me that didn't grow up in that system are going, that seems really weird, where they look at me and say, you're so out of it. So you cannot change the pattern if you don't understand the problem. And I think what not enough people are identifying is the problem of the digital drug dealing because the people who are doing the dealing are the networks, are the, the, the social media companies, the digital companies. Their market cap is determined by how many addicts they have on their system. So they're not going to reveal it and they're hiring. Here's the thing. I, if I'm going up against Google, if I'm going up against YouTube or Netflix or whoever, like whatever that's Facebook. Here's the thing. Here's companies that have billions of dollars of resources. They have the best psychologists in the world. They have the best mathematicians in the world. They have, they have a resource capital that is so superior to me becoming addicted to whatever they're propagating. As soon as I enter the game, it's like walking into a crack house and just say, hey, shoot me up with whatever you got. And so as citizens of the society and people who are raising, we have to recognize the seriousness that this is an addiction and that the addiction for many of our youth is so total and complete to remove them from that is going to be the equivalent of having an intervention with a hardcore drug addict. And the likelihood of your success 
is very low. So to completely answer your question, divine intervention. The pain is going to have to be enough for that person that they are going to be able to say, I can't do this anymore. I need a better way. And when that happens, perhaps you can you know, interact with them and, and create the support that they're going to need to extricate themselves out of it. Otherwise, they'll find themselves back in it before they know it, just like a, a hardcore addict. And I think we haven't really identified the, the, the level of the problem to the extent that it needs to be. And then you combine that. There's another combination because now we're living in 80 years since we've radically altered the food chain, disrupted our digestive systems, added a host of uh, enzymatic inhibitors, probiotic destroyers. We've added preservatives and dyes and chemicals that have unknown toxic effects long-term. Um, and this has been going on for 80 years. So now we have 12% of the population that has gastrointestinal related issues that are going to emergency hospital visits for, a, for gastrointestinal. We've got 100 million people on digestive aid. We've got a massive problem with uh, depression because we have neurochemical burnout essentially from getting these feedback loops. Now I can't break down the proteins to make the neurotransmitters. I don't have the bacteria present because I got blasted with antibiotics over and over again. I, my diet is crap. I can't digest the have things. So I go with the sugariest thing because it's the easiest thing that I can possibly digest. I've got a host of, now I've got candida and I've got fungal infections. I've got a bacterial older growth. I've got a neurochemical uh, deficiencies. I'm 40 pounds overweight. I got a host of biochemicals in my fat tissues and I'm addicted. The only way that I get feedback is if I'm playing call of duty on a thing where I'm getting a, a dopamine response system, even though I'm in the basement of my parents' house waiting for the next stimulus check for a bunch of old guys from the 1940s to figure out wh wh how they're going to dole out the money from the few people that are producing value to me. And I'm going to get upset and get on a chart and say, I'm on the left or I'm on the right, or these guys do this and hoping that someone is going to outside of myself is going to solve my problem because I'm so disempowered. I'm so biochemically deficient. I can't get out of the situation because I'm locked in a system that I don't even know how bad it is because it's been this way progressively degeneration for 80 years. So from my standpoint, it's like, well, I can't figure out all of those mediums by things. I understand the problem, I think, pretty well because I've been studying it my whole life. What I would suggest is people have to uh, re recondition their body so that they can make the neurochemicals. Second, when you do that, you need to create some sort of reward system that doesn't involve um, digital feedback. And the third thing is you need to be in a support group where socially you are going to get acknowledged with the human tribe, not on a digital program where you are going to physically meet, hug, high five, um, and feel the emotional proximity and the cascade of positivity that can happen from that in order to have a hope to overcome this situation. That's my whole take on that. And on my side, as our company, we, we work on the um, fixing the neurochemical generation component side of it to the best we can and on all that area, but the other areas of the care are best left to, um, you know, psychologists and addiction specialists who understand this on a, on a, on a really in-depth scale. I, lots of food for thought there. I, you know, the other thing that comes up for me as you're sharing this is wondering how you feel about some of the younger entrepreneurs out in the space, because for, for you, I'm sure you come, you meet a lot of them at your events and, and the networking that you're doing. And, you know, on, if you're on social media and we talked about clubhouse briefly, and what's interesting is there's this culture of clubhouse of a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, whether they're, you know, really successful entrepreneurs or, or just getting started with their entrepreneurship. Um, but like there's a, there's so much in that hustle culture. And so much in like the obsession with status, with proving themselves, with being validated and making money. And Jason and I talk about this a lot because there's a concern there from the mental health standpoint. You know, there's there's like the side of, of these people being so in their ego and positioning themselves as if they're helping. But then you constantly wonder, like, are they just pretending that they're helping me, but ultimately they just want me to help them by giving them money, paying, paying for their products or services. And then the other side of it is 
the mental health issue of the comparison trap of people seeing someone like that, who's off, you know, proclaiming, if you just follow my five-step formula, you're going to get the same results and not everybody's going to get those results. Right. But then we feel bad about ourselves if we don't get the results that we were promised. And I actually think this is, this is also an issue, not just in the entrepreneurship side of things, but I'm sure you come up against this a lot in the supplement world because a lot of people feel like they can't trust supplements anymore because there's so many false claims about supplements and people just think like, why should I bother? Am I just peeing away the products that I spent all this money on? And so it's interesting from those two sides and how the, in a Venn diagram perspective, it's like, there's a lot of issues with trust because people often feel like they're being taken advantage of based on bad practices of of others that are really good at marketing themselves, but not so great at giving the results that they say you're going to get. Great question. And so I've thought about this a lot um, because being in the nutritional supplement industry, and I I got into the nutritional supplement as first as a consumer and then eventually as a sponsored athlete, then um, I ended up open owning my own store or working in a nutritional store in a gym and then developing my own store and being a personal trainer and then um, into formulation and the writing of educational materials and then eventually owning my own company. I even worked in a warehouse that would dole them out when I was in college. So I've really worked at all aspects of it. And I would say that 95% of what's out there is garbage. It's built on, um, it takes really good information. And this is the same as these young kids. And I'm, I'm going to kind of share from my perspective what I've learned in this career, and then you can apply it to everything else. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll see some research about, you know, X, Y nutritional supplement and, and it'll have all these propensities and abilities and they'll work that in with their copywriting team to, to, to make it very sexy and attractive and boil it down into kind of a narrative that will get people to say, hey, that might work for me. And the part is what, there's two ways to build a company. The first way is to build a company based on marketing. You spend your money on the marketing budget, how great a copywriter you get, how much you spend on advertising, how much you curate and manage that message to deliver the promise to get somebody in on the product. Then there's another type of company, which is most of the best companies I know, is that the founder of the company was someone who had a major challenge with their health or vitality or something. And they found this research to figure out whatever the problem was, or they met a person along the way, an advisor, a mentor, and, and they did this and it corrected their condition. And then they discovered they needed to get more of it because they told their friends. And then they discovered about the product quality issue. And then they ended up getting, you know, finding it and sourcing it and had to produce their own company and go through all the growth pains. And eventually they get to a brand and they become a, eventually after 20 years a world recognized brand for that particular product. That's pretty much the, the, the backstory of every great company in every great area. So I think a lot of us are way too worried about how things are going to sort out. There have been shysters since the beginning of time. There has been no shortage of them. There out, it may be more readily apparent today because we get access to all the digital information, but, but the bottom line is, is excellence is its own reward and it never goes out of style. And if you can produce something of value in any field, health, business, a supplement, information, education, whatever it is, and you are passionate about it. And to really produce excellence, I mean to be produce something that's really extraordinary, you had better be putting in the time. You had better be putting in every ounce and fiber of your being because we are living on a planet with 7 billion people. And if you think that you've got a one in a million idea, there's what, 7,000 other people that's got that idea too that you're competing against and they're all on the same chat group and form that you are. So get ready. Um, we, I think Carl Jung said that we don't, um, we're, we're not possessed by ideas. Ideas possess us. And so 
what happens is I think we get a concept or we worry about things or whatever, and we start losing track of becoming a quote unquote socially responsible person that is being the police dog. And the counter to that digital dealing, which is a real thing, like I like talked about, we talked about this kind of attention based society. Well, what's the pendulum that that's now coming out the other way? Cancel culture. So now we've got these two <laughs> paradigms. So the, the, the point is now is, well, okay, you said something 22 years ago that wasn't quite right, you're done. And you said this and that's not true. So first of all, if we do a careful examination of our own historical, an honest, thorough, moral and ethical uh, review of ourself, we've got enough material to sort out that we don't need to fix anybody else's. I'm still working on myself after, after almost 50 years and I got a lot of work on things I need to do. Uh, with myself and what I, there's a couple of things that I'm really good about really good at and in in what I've learned about being really good at something is I take everything with kind of a grain of salt like well this is the best that we know at this point but there may be an opening that's the first sign of real greatness and excellence the second thing is is we focus on the things that we control and the things that we can't and the third thing is don't cast stones at glass houses and the fourth thing is sticks and stones can't break my bones, but name can, can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. So those four principles will allow me to live a life without any problems with whatever is going on, because what might be an absolute unmitigated emotional, physical, financial, psychological, and physiological disaster for some person at this point may be the springboard that allows them to take a complete, thorough, moral, and ethical inventory of themselves that launches them into an area that will lead them to uh, the discovery of what it is that their essence is, what it is they're supposed to do, and how they're supposed to do it. So I get it, and I certainly can understand the problems of it, and I have an incredible amount of empathy for it. But I also recognize that I only have so much attention units that I can, you know, I have a hundred attention units a day and how I dis, how I dis, distribute those within my own world, I can get caught up in a lot of things. And guess what? If I'm caught up in a lot of people's other stuff, guess what I've, I've, I've bought in? I'm hooked on the drug. I'm hooked on the drug of blame. I'm hooked on the drug, drug of acknowledgement. I'm hooked on the drug of a tribalism. I'm hooked on the drug of some secret. Uh, and all of these kind of tribal dynamics that have been fused into this digital delivery system to create a cascade of illusions in our brain, what ultimately leave you as if you went on a bender every single day, because at the end of the day, it's not built on foundational reward systems that human neurological um, excellence is cultivated on. I feel like I just want to, you know, raise up my hands and and give you an amen and hallelujah like like just amen hallelujah brother wade because you're you're dropping so much heartfelt wisdom in this episode and you know we if we talk about as you so wonderfully described wade i mean there there, there are so many aspects of human society that need healing at indivi- on an individual level of course we can't heal society until people take the personal responsibility to heal themselves. But in that regard, you know, we, we talked about mental health and emotional wellness at a few points in this episode. One thing that was not surprising if we uncork and look under the hood of the Western medicine paradigm, a couple good friends of Whitney and mine are psychotherapists. And one of them I was having a conversation with about a month ago, and she was saying that they get no training in school whether it's their master's or PhD program, much like any other general practitioner or heart doctor, cardiologist, on the link between nutrition and how that affects human health. She was saying specifically in the mental health field, there's not a lot of connection between probiotics, prebiotics, proteolytic enzymes. And we're having a whole discussion on, on why aren't you educated as a clinical psychotherapist or psychologist on what you put in your body affects your mental health, the inflammation of it, the toxicity, the acidosis. 
so I'm I'm curious with what you're doing with bio optimizers. I'm gonna give that to you. I'm I'm gonna hang my hat on bio optimizers till the day I die. Wait, I like that pronunciation better. So with bio optimizers, I've been taking your Cognibiotic. I've been taking your Mass Zymes. As Whitney mentioned, we've been absolutely just raving and enjoying your enzyme based products. How do those products and enzymes in general play into the conversation, as you mentioned before, of neurochemistry, dopamine, and helping people to change their relationship to their mental health? Because it is a crisis. I mean, let's be honest, the, the levels of depression, anxiety, suicide in our country and the world right now, especially in the midst of a pandemic, the, the statistics are outrageous. So how do, how do enzyme therapies and, and all of this play into the role of people taking more responsibility for their mental health and hopefully healing it? Well, there's, as you may know, I'm a broad-based thinker, and I'm a student of philosophy, psychology, metaphysics, and nutrition. And so part of what I have learned is through books, and part of it is through practice and intuitive components through observation. One of the things that I developed was great observational skills uh, because of my early youth, which I mentioned before. And so I'm going to make a wild suggestion that some people might seem as conspiratory. And I don't want to do that, and, and I'm not here to say it's a conspiratory. So it's, it's one of two things, I believe, the current situation that we're in. One is unintended consequences of rapid technological innovation. That would be the most likely scenario that we are facing. The second thing that I study every day, I have a copy of this on my book, on my desk, see, is the art of war. And which is uh, a very interesting philosophical book. And if you actually read it, it says, one of the first lines by Sun Tzu is, the art of war is to subdue your enemy without firing a single shell. In the East, a culture that has existed, for example, China for 5,000 years, an empire continuous for 5,000 years, India maybe even longer than that, they've recognized that the consequences of open ballistic warfare as we would know it today uh, cannot be sustained long-term for the health of a culture. America is founded on freedom and individuality and do what you want and go for it. We were the, we're the, we're the, everybody that in, in the United States immigrates, and I'm going to get to your question in a minute because I think it's really, the United States has the greatest history of immigration on the planet. They take in a million people. I'm an immigrant to the United States because I believe in the foundational concepts that were put forth in the Constitution. And I have a foundational belief of the principles of the wealth of nations and the production of value. And then, then what's happened is somewhere around World War II, or maybe actually before that, I would say, probably around the turn of the century when you had the, the concept of... Um, I would say Marxist philosophy started to move into the intellectual debate. And then eventually we ended up into, you know, the Bolshevik revolution. We had world war one, and, and then that set up the, the, the course for the rise of Nazism and, and world war two. And in, in that culture, particularly in Germany, there was the cultivation and almost a cult like development into chemicalization. You know, if you look at most of the big chemical giants and pharmaceutical giants, they emerged out of that, out of that kind of concept, and then systematically over time, after the war happened, those institutionalized drug companies started to get their fingers inside of the political debate. And we moved away from the capitalistic wealth of nations so that we have some sort of hybrid between socialism 
and capitalism that's neither either one of them. And so the arguments on both sides are abjectly false. What we have, I think, was identified by uh, Peter Mackey in his book, Conscious Capitalism, is we have a form of crony capitalism with a Robin Hood Marxist fusion. Now that's all laced in uh, cancel culture, in labeling of very derogatory associations with anybody that has success. These are, these, these are all models that don't work long-term and has resulted in the chaos. And what that means is, is we've turned over our greatest and brightest students, put them in an education system where they're not given the complete level of information. We compartmentalize them to the point, point that they work as a very systematized and easily controllable component because of the debt loads that they take on in order to get the level of excellence. The pharmaceutical companies are able, and chemical-based companies through financial leverage on Wall Street are able to, to take on inexpensive labor from other companies which, or countries which aren't supportive of the same laws that we're subjected to here. Therefore, we have products and services that don't meet their, their, what I would call legitimate standards. Our political system has been hijacked by special interest capitalistic in the, in the implementation of politicalized rules into our food, into our drugs, into what we can say, into our marketing. So we're living under this illusion that we're a free society. But the reality is, after World War II, when the United States dropped the nuclear bomb on Japan and ended Japanese imperialism and ushered in the digital age and the movement into this whole fusion of the development of monoculture farming and, the, and then the event, eventual defendant dependency on nitrogen-based fertilizers that depleted the soil, the minerals, and then the advent of the chemicals through these same chemical companies that rose to power during World War II in order to mitigate the damages that we've done from moving away from 12,000 years of crop degeneration. And now we le left into a place where you're not able to extract the amount of food or the nutrients you require to make the neurochemistry inside your brain. And we don't know that because it's been going on for so long that people don't know where a carrot comes from. They've never actually went out and killed their own animal. That if they're on a meat-based diet, they, they, they don't know what, uh, it, it's kind of like the matrix. We don't know what tasty wheat tastes like. Why does everything taste the same? Well, because we don't know what it tasted in its original thing. It's this flat, and then we add colors, and we add dyes, and we add preservatives to make, to give us these, false reward systems, which would naturally be found in nature. We developed a, 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 an association with perfection, uh, this kind of aesthetic perfection inside our fruits and vegetables that we have, which requires uh, genetic uh, alterations and selections and all sorts of different agents. So basically, we are living in a sea of falseness. And what happens is the basic neurochemical requirements that allow someone to have positive feedback systems in their neurology are virtually impossible for a person to acquire unless they've spent an incredible amount of time, energy, and money, which they may not have, in order to develop um, a quality, healthy program for themselves. So either one, you, you, you move off to some commune somewhere where you're living off the land and, and have no money and wearing sackcloth every day so that you can have your superfoods. And I've been in those things. I've been in the two-year raw food movement. Uh, or you, you, you exit from society and you live at an ashram. I did that too. Um, you become kind of a health fanatic. I've been one of those. Okay. And you cultivate some sort of identification based on the current knowledge to be able to overcome and survive the best of what I weigh. So, three things. It's unintended consequences which are putting mutation um, levers on the species of Homo sapiens. So one could look at from a top down as, hey, this is part of the evolutionary process that's happening. The sun is going through a different phase. It's causing mutations and we're making all these decisions and some people are going to survive and some people are going to mutate into Homo spiritus or Homo digitalis or... Homo Borgus or whatever the hell that people are going to become. Okay, that's one option. 
you can look at that level. Number two, you could say, you know what? We really messed up. We got off sidetrack. We let these other special interest groups take over the things and we need to reclaim that. That's another level, whether you're doing that in your own personal life by developing a farm or getting involved in a political movement or developing your own supplement company or nutritional company that you're doing your piece on the king. Or three, we're actually in a state of war. And this war is not a war that we thought of before in the common sense points, which I send missiles this way and you send missiles this way or bullets or guns. And then the fourth option, it's some version of all of those. And I would say that it's the last piece. The conflict for resources on this planet is something that all organisms and species have gone through. And I think 99 point some percentage of species that have existed on this planet um, don't exist anymore. So extermination is an aspect of, the hum of, of all biological systems. And some people would say that's the law of entropy. And then other people would say, well, it's the loss of syntropy because when you see things descend into chaos, there is a reordinance of things into new and more complex beings. So I believe that we're in a major evolutionary shift. And the good news is things like enzymes and probiotics are the only catalysts inside the body that are not building materials and they're not energy units. These are the workers that allow you to um, deliver biochemical transactions. Enzymes are the units from thinking to blinking. The difference between a stone, a plant, and a person is the totality of your enzymatic capacity and your ability to write metabolic checks. Because like I said, everything from thinking to blinking requires an enzyme. A probiotic is a single cell organism that has developed specific enzymatic pathways in, in a, a, a different level of mobility than say a regular enzyme that performs specific actions either in contradiction to our health or in support of our health in our microbiome. So we live in a symbiotic relationship with probiotics, uh, these workers. And enzymes and probiotics are, in my opinion, are the only thing that does any work in the body. And so if you go back to nutrition, which that's something I've studied my whole life, exercise, physiology, nutrition, background, high performance health, organic health, everything that you can possibly imagine. Well, what's interesting is almost all of the books omit the role of enzymes and probiotics. Now, probiotics have come to a little bit more light in the last five, 10 years, but I learned about this after I crashed and burned after my Mr. Universe contest in 2003. And I got lucky. I met a doctor that, you know, helped me recover my own health. And I learned about this way back then and started practicing it. And then it just so happens now our company became to be in vogue because I've been doing this for 15 years. Nothing, I'm, I'm not extraordinary. I don't have any super PhDs. I didn't come up with any chemicals. I was just a guy that made all the wrong mistakes out of good intentions that led me to a chaotic situation that led me to someone who did make the right moves after he went all through the chaos, who shared that knowledge with me. We've been sharing this knowledge for the last 15 years, and now it's come to public fruition. And we've been in a position where we can now hire the PhDs to actually do the research on the gut biome and get the people in here to develop how do we rebuild the essential neurochemicals that a great number of the population is lacking? Do we need enzymes? Do we need hydrochloric acid? Do we need probiotics? Do we need something to build the microbiome? Do we actually have to take extracts so that we can even have enough materials to manufacture the deficient neurochemicals in somebody's brain? And it turns out it's all of the above. And that's what we've dedicated our life to. And we've had some extraordinary breakthroughs in the last few years, because going back to the original question of, you know, incremental gains over time, I've been on this game since I was 15 years old. And I feel like we're only starting to break real ground on where we can contribute to a global scale in the last three years. So that's 30 years. I think, you know, there's so many aspects of you spoke about human evolution and there's a lot of interesting ideas floating around that Whitney and I have been discussing lately, Wade. And so to get, to get uncomfortable for a second, 
there's a lot of research by people, you know, like Elon Musk and and some other people out there talking about um, eventually terraforming and colonizing Mars and and having that as sort of a escape plan from planet Earth if things continue to degrade to a certain level here. But beyond that, you know, with nutrition, I think longevity is also a part of that conversation of optimizing the human vessel. And one thing that is really interesting are people working on technologies to potentially upload human consciousness into different biological or digital vessels, that the idea that our consciousness will never die, that our physical vessels may die, but our consciousness may not. And this brings up a lot of interesting ethical implications, and it sort of takes the longevity question into an immortality question. And I'm curious what your feelings are in a general sense about this conversation of, of, of not only, you know, longevity, but the idea of um, transferring our consciousness into, into a different vessel. And that really changes our relationship to life and death, doesn't it? I mean, really, the, the, the core aspects of our human experience of knowing that we're going to die. But what if we didn't have to die? How would that change our experience of life? I mean, it really is kind of an esoteric question, but I think talking about longevity is what brought it up for me and want to know what your your thoughts and feelings are on all that. My business partner and I, Matt Gallant, um, we've been in this conversation literally since the inception of our friendship going back over 20 years. And when we first met, Matt was a pretty hardcore atheist that was... Um, really into finding immortality by the uploading of consciousness into some sort of cybernetic organism that would exist perpetually as described primarily in the writings of um, Dr. Wallace from Neotech, which was a kind of a interesting concept that he had come into. And in my own world, I had uh, a near death experience at 22, which uh, took me through the life review and and had an experience of God, universality, whatever you want to call it. It was very personal, very real, and very dynamic and changed the course of my life at that moment. And so I can only speak from my own experience. And when we met a number of years later and started a business together, we would start from these uh, debates, which were spirited to say the least. And Matt and I believe in challenging each other's opinions and it's led to the cultivation of um, number one, a lot of good information. It's also exposed our own biases and flaws within our thinking. And it's also helped us, I think, develop more robust solutions relative to our company. But in those debates, we would, he, I was a Yogananda devotee and we'd talk about God and he'd like, come on, that's a, you, you know, kind of a fantasy. And I gave him a book called The Power Now by Eckhart Tolle, who was a guy sitting on a bench in Vancouver that kind of people had known. And I had actually been friends with his publishers. And, and uh, that book was an opening for him. Um, and later on, we went into Power Versus Force, which and all the collective works of Dr. David Hawkins and the map of consciousness, sorting out this whole thing of consciousness itself relative to this plane. That evolved into a variety of different practices throughout the years. My study of uh, various religions and philosophical doctrines uh, and the listening to minds far greater than my own in order to kind of work out some of these puzzles throughout time. And it's, I don't have any definitive answers. What I would say, though, from my own experience in developing some of it, which is rather recent, is that our paradigm of our own consciousness, I think, is the issue. So what if the ego, what we call the ego, the sense of I, and this association with this physical body, because if I take here, let's, let's do a simple experiment. If I say... Um, if I cut off your arm, are you still you? Well, yeah. If I cut off your leg, are you still you? If I cut off both your arms or both your legs, you're still you, right? Now I can say, um, 
well, what it, we're having this conversation, you already have, you're hearing what I'm saying, but you're also having thoughts about what I'm saying. So not only are you hearing externalized information, there's some sort of internal dialogue that's going on simultaneously. So there's an observation of thoughts. So you can say, this is my thoughts. Okay. Well, then that means if these are my thoughts, you can't be your thoughts and you can't be your body. And you can say, well, these are my feelings. Okay. Well, if you're observing of your feelings, then you can't be your feelings. So if you're not your body, you're not your thoughts, and you're not your feelings, well, what are you? And what I believe is that is the universe, is consciousness itself. And the idea that you are a living, sentient being with this human history is merely a fractionized aspect of all that is, much like a wave cresting on the top of the ocean that is not the ocean. It rises, it crests, and it falls back within the wave. Now, the ocean can exist without the wave, but the wave cannot exist without the ocean. They are one in the same. And the culmination of our entire life is merely the rising and inevitable crash of that wave. And I believe the ultimate goal is to be able to recognize that I am both the wave and the ocean simultaneously. And when the inevitable component of the dissolution of what I think is me happens, which we will all experience, is to recognize that that is part of the natural and ultimate state that all of us must experience. And it's perfect within the divine order of itself. And you can go out like a squiggling sheep or you can go out roaring like a lion. And I believe the journey of our life is to get to a place where we can go out like a lion and rush towards the ocean. Not in a way that's self-destructive, but to say, it's time to return back to the source. And I think our view of death isn't even the total picture. So I'm an as uh, ascribing to reincarnation. And I believe that even after death, there is an ego structure that is retained. And there's illustrations of this in other religious doctrines. But I think the ultimate experience is the complete dissolution of that. And so that's when someone like Jesus said that uh, I will make thee a pillar in thy house and thou shalt go out no more, I think was in reference to the conscious awareness of totality, which we would call enlightenment. And whether that takes form in this domain or not doesn't really matter. But that's a very, very high state of awareness and existence. And that's not easily achievable, certainly not in one lifetime. It may require many and, you know, we're doing the best that we can to get there, uh, but it's a big topic. Maybe the biggest, you know, we're talking about existence, sense of self, life itself. And uh, I just feel like at so many moments I was just closing my eyes and vibing with you, Wade, you know, and I just feel like you, you're such a vast resource, a resource of so much knowledge. And for us... These are some of the most important questions. Who are we? What are we? Why are we here? What is what is the nature of life and existence itself? I mean, we're this this is this is what it's all about right here in my opinion. You know, and and much like you, these are the kind of conversations I can dig into by a fireplace with a cup of hot mushroom chocolate and talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. And now I really want a cup of hot mushroom chocolate. It also is so wonderful to talk to you because um it reminds me of one of the big reasons that I've been missing the trade shows that we typically go to because 
uh, at the natural products trade show, for example, we get to connect with the owners uh, behind the products. And one thing I have noticed over the years is that will greatly influence how I feel about a product because I get to have that experience with somebody and feel their energy and better understand them. And sometimes it's a make or break moment. And hearing all of this has, you know, and just connecting with you throughout this time has really made me feel so thrilled that I've been taking your products <laughs> because I really believe in infusing your body with the energy behind how something's made to your point. Like a lot of us don't think about the path that a product has taken to reach our hands, to, to be put into our mouths. We, so, we often eat on such an unconscious level. And I really think when it comes to supplements, as I was saying before, that it is incredibly important to understand the story behind it and the, and the who made them and why they've been made the way that they are. And I was already very impressed with everything I've learned about bioptimizers, as I will say it, <laughs> as I will pronounce it. Um, but this has just taken it to a whole nother level, which reminds me of my question for you, because I held off. I was thinking, I'm going to I'm going to take my daily Cognibiotics while we're on this podcast, but I'll wait to hear some more details. And then I got a little nervous because sometimes with things like this, I'm I'm really into following the rules. And the direction says to take two capsules upon wakening. And I no longer have an empty stomach and it's hours, many hours since I woke up. So I'm like, should I be taking this? Is it too late in the day at almost 4 p.m.? Um, now, I know you make your other probiotics, which I have downstairs, uh, but I'm curious uh, what, you know, when it comes to taking something like this, is timing, how is the timing playing a role in that? Because I imagine it's written on there for a reason. And that may help me um, add it into my day and my, my visuals of how I map out my home with my supplements. Cause I, cause I think I have all of the products that you make, uh, all the vegan versions, at least, um, the, uh, gluten guardian is one of my favorites we've talked about on this show. And I, I try actually not to take that because I'm very sensitive to gluten. And unfortunately, even those supplements do not fully, uh, remove the effects from my body, but they do really help. I regularly take both probiotics, uh, the Cognibiotics, as well as the uh, the other probiotic formulation you have. And then I love the enzymes. And those are also, I've t- we have the mass enzymes, I think they're called. And then the one that I get really excited to take, but I always take it earlier in the day, is um, it starts with a K. K-Pax. It's right? K-Pax. What's that? Capex. Yes, I love those as well. And then I also started reintegrating HCL thanks to you. So because I, you know, we were blessed from with your company sending us over the products to try. Now I have like this whole array of them. But coming back to my question in terms of timing, because I think that's one of the big mysteries for a lot of consumers. It's it's like not only which product should I buy, but then when do I take them and why? So I'd love to hear that before we close out with you today. Sure thing. So first and foremost, labels are built to meet the FDA and FTC requirements. Um, And in most cases, when you get to know owners and stuff, they take oftentimes prodigious amounts of given products. And if you actually trace back to the research Going back to our early stuff about supplement companies, oftentimes when you actually see the dosages required by research in order to produce the benefits required, the nutritional supplements being sold in the store, regardless of the quality, wouldn't be in sufficient quantity or quality in order to, 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 to meet the demands of what was actually illustrated in whatever research. And that's one of the reasons we we have our own PhD team and microbiome that we run all sorts of experiments that Matt and I go, Oh, what happens if we hit this with EMF or what happened if we add vitamins to it or whatever, <laughs> you know, we, we're just thinking of what we're, our question is, well, what if we do this? And most of the experiments are, are what many people would call a fail, but then we have these discoveries. So one of the things we just released a new book called the biological optimization blueprint 
which is kind of an illustrative guide of how Matt and I go about systematically determining the products that a person might need, the process of determining how you get those products, and then how do you manage dose on an individual basis, both in the short, medium, and long term. And so to answer your question, there's no absolute answer. However, there are tendencies and patterns that we can learn. And what I suggest for anybody taking supplementation, they can go to our website, they can go and download the Awesome Health course. It's free. It's a, it's a 12-week course. It has five to 15-minute videos where I explained everything I've learned under a systematic system I developed called the Awesome System, which is how biological organisms work based on cellular function and how you devote your time, your energy, and your money. And we don't get the supplements to topic number five, quite a ways down the road. And when I look at supplementation, first, you want to be able to, to, diagn to diagnose through the use of an expert what you might be potentially deficient in. Because you could spend a lot of time and a lot of money just randomly shotgunning stuff that might be good, but might not be good for you. Um, the second thing that you want to, so, so uh, a spectra cell test is a great one, a gut biome or uh, like a gut map or a biome test. So you're, you know, if your neurochemistry is off or you've been on meds or whatever, or you have infections or you struggle with your health, you know, there's the kind of, hey, take two of these and see you in the morning kind of stuff. Or there's, you know what, I'm going at this like a biohacker and I'm solving this problem. Cause that's the way Matt and I go at it. We forget everything else. And there's three levels of doses. There's the minimal effective dosage. There's the maximal tolerable dosage. And then there's the optimal dosage. And eventually you want to get to the optimal dosage and you may have to fluctuate between those two paradigms to get there. But there was um, these guys back in the 70s who founded orthomolecular psychiatry. Their name were Dr. Linus Pauling, the two-time Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Abram Hoffer, and Dr. David Hawkins, who I made a referral to about the map of consciousness, who was a psychiatrist who worked in conjunction with these gentlemen to develop what was called at the time orthomolecular psychiatry, and that is the treating of advanced states of mental disease using supraphysiological dosages of various vitamins, minerals, components, bacteria, all this sort of stuff. And it's, I got the book from the seventies. I don't even know how these guys were figuring this stuff out. It's incredible. It's a very dense, oh, a, you know, opaque kind of text. <laughs> it's pretty heavy duty going. I don't necessarily recommend you read it, but what I was able to garner out of that, particularly with Dr. Linus Pauling's approach, which is commonly known in the world with vitamin C dosages. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna explain the whole context, because I like to explain the context before we get to the content of your question, because I wanna be specific and precise for people to systematically address these things. And Linus Pauling was famous for detoxifying people from heavy metal exposure uh, using high dosages of vitamin C. And what they would do is you would start to increase the dosage incrementally in a structurized format. You'd start at maybe three grams a day, four grams, five grams, six grams. Each day you would add an extra gram of vitamin C until you broke the GI barrier, AKA you got the runs. And they would then titrate down. They, I mean, they would lower the dosage. So let's say you got up to 10, you might lower it down to nine or eight. And they would stay at nine or eight till you you, 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 you broke the GI barrier again, and then you would drop it maybe another gram or two and, until eventually you were just on a minimal dosage. So when I started doing research um, in nutritional testing and everything from live blood cell analysis to hair analysis to eventually what I think is one of the gold standards is spectra cell analysis, I noticed that different people with genetics and epigenetics um, would have there was dietary suggestions that would allow them to absorb and utilize various vitamins and nutrients. And also those dietary practices would be deficient. Matt's a ketogenic guy. I'm a vegetarian. We're pretty far end of the spectrum, right? And what we were able to determine through spectra cell testing is that there's certain tendencies within certain diets. And that means 
If you can imagine all the nutrients that you require to be at your optimal level as filling up a bucket, that could be neurochemicals, chemistry, chemicals, that could be vitamins, that could be minerals, that could be essential fatty acids. If you are suffering from a deficiency or a depletion of any given nutrient, I would say that your lifestyle, your burn rate is like a hole in the bucket. In other words, imagine a hole in that bucket and that's your burn rate. And, and if stress goes up or maybe demands would, would be required, you would require more nutrients. And if that goes down, you require less. So that's always the fluctuating factor. So it's almost like a valve as opposed to a hole, right? Then your lifestyle is the valve. And what happens is people go on a lifestyle and they exhaust their supply and then they have to tight back the valve, which means your life is uh, compromised in some way. Well, what I said is like, okay, well, if we can get a baseline of what everybody is by doing one of these tests and we can look at the particular nutrients that are deficient within this person, the, the problem is, is we don't necessarily know what the optimal level is for a lot of these vitamins and minerals. That's going to be not as clinical feedback. It's going to be more subjective in how you feel. So you're going to have to journal in, in concordance with your digital data. But let's say you've got a deficiency in... Um, the development of serotonin. You've done some tests. They're saying you're serotonin deficient. And that's because you're not able to make the polypeptide change. You're, you're not converting your protein into the amino acids that make the neurotransmitters inside your body. Okay. This is going to be relative to cognitive biotics. So we go, okay, well, let's look at how am I, okay, number one, is my dietary practices providing me sufficient amount of protein in my diet to be converted into the amino acids? Oh, yes, I'm getting 100 grams of protein a day. So that's not the issue. Okay, so am I actually breaking down that protein? So do I have sufficient amount of enzymes? Do I have sufficient amount of hydrochloric acid? And do I have sufficient amount of the bacteria that are developed to make those neurotransmitters? Well, if you're deficient in those neurotransmitters and you're getting enough protein, then you've got a conversion issue. It's one of those three things. Simple. So what do you do? You take enzymes, you take hydrochloric acid, and you take as many of those probiotics as you can. Now, the good news is, is you only need a little bit of enzymes, but there's no tolerance to the enzymes. You can take, I've taken a thousand a day and it doesn't show up in your, your it's the only thing I've ever taken in massive doses that doesn't show up um, in your, in a stool test. I've taken up to a thousand. That's a unique thing about enzymes. So our body absorbs and utilizes. There seems to be no limit to the amount of enzymes you can put in your system. That's an interesting component because that's the metabolic worker factor. And I think one of the reasons I enjoy robust health and cognitive capacity is because I've been pounding enzymes for so long and everybody I know that's been doing that has noticed the same thing over 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Second thing is, I'm assuming if you're 35 or older, or older, you may, there's a high likelihood that you don't have enough hydrochloric acid, which shifts the uh, pH level to the breakdown of the protein. And then the third thing, okay, if you have noticed that you're, you're, you, you wake up in the morning and you're, you know, you have the brain fog. You're not able to get yourself going. You don't necessarily feel happy and out of bed or rise and shine kind of person, or you struggle with keeping your mood regulated. Well, chances are that you have some sort of dysbiosis in your guts and you can do a test and find that out. But in particular, you want to look And when we develop cognitive biotics, we uh, hired two different geniuses. One was a genius, uh, a neurophysiologist, who is an expert in Chinese medicine and put together the combination of Chinese herbs, which have been shown for thousands of years to enhance mood. And just so you know, Chinese medicine, the only correlation with Western medicine was figured out by a guy by the name of Charles Poliquin, who was known as the strength sensei who coached 27 a gold medalist in 27 different sports. Think about that. And one of the things that he uh, he used to read, he used to learn all these different languages because he saw that there was biases within development of various countries in how they researched that they did. And so he would learn that, okay, the Russians were good at this and the Germans were good at this and the Japanese were good at this. So he would learn the language and see what biases they had, what they figured out. And then he would bring that back. And he was the only guy I knew of that made the connection between Chinese medicine 
the five elements of Chinese medicine and the neurotransmitter dominance in the body. So we got a Chinese expert to develop the herbs that would have known to enhance uh, neurological function. And then we've got the PhDs in microbiome that said, well, here's the bacteria that actually manufacture these neurotransmitters. Okay, well, let's put that bacteria with the right amount of prebiotics so that they don't starve to death on the way there. You put them in a freeze-dried state so they become activated when they come to the state. You're not relying on the temperature variances, which have a huge impact on the growth rates or whether that bacteria is alive when it gets to your intestinal tract. Then we put it together with the herbs so that you would get an initial somatic effect when you first start taking it. So you, the Chinese herbs kind of kick in and you kind of feel that. And then over the period of taking that regularly, you are going to repopulate that bacteria strain inside your body so that you start manufacturing. So I'm assuming that your diet is getting enough protein. You're breaking down the protein into the amino acids. You've got the right bacteria to make that final conversion to turn them into the neurotransmitters inside your body. Bingo, you solve the problem because you've solved the 80 year issue that we talked about systematically through this process. So there is no one size, one fits what all. What I can say is we have to put on the label based that you should take this much and this is a suggested time in order to do that. And that's all relative to make people feel good. I like taking it in the morning. Matt likes taking it in the evening. Matt's a fat based guy. I'm a carbivore. How we metabolize food is different. And so what I would say is that's the right time for him to take it. I like taking my P3OM at night. He likes taking it with his meals, but he has a high meat-based diet and needs extra digestive capacity. I don't have a high base meal diet. So here's the two owners of the company that have figured out very specific paradigms with the exact same products that work for us. And that's why we released the book. And that's why we've kind of explained, if you're going to solve a multi-generational problem on nutrition relative to your own needs, you need more than labeling, you need testing, and you need a system to go about addressing those issues. And it's one of the reasons why we offer a money back guarantee on everything that anybody takes from us. Somebody tries our stuff and it doesn't work for them. Let us know. We give you your money back because what we're, what we're here to encourage is for people to do these systematic experiments. And if our product fits, if they've put the right process together and, 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 and our product fits within their body of knowledge and elicits a response that they're looking for, yay, everybody's happy. Most people are happy to exchange value for that thing. If for some reason it doesn't work out for that person, I'm like, hey, Thanks for trying us. I don't want to discourage you for your journey to health. We're going to give you your money back. We're going to take that feedback from you. And we're both happy. Maybe we can even suggest that, you know what? You didn't need the cognibiotics. You would have done a lot better on, you know, leaky gut guardian because you've got a biofilm issue that none of these good guys can think. And we've got a way to solve that. Or maybe you need to bypass all that because your body just doesn't manufacture for some chemical transaction. You don't have any of the neurotransmitters that's required in that thing. Why not try some of our nootropic products, which will address the neurotransmitters themselves to be able to, to, to get to that state. So that's how we've kind of systematically gone through the system. And we've, you know, we're, we're both physiologists and personal trainers and kind of, uh, you know, pedestrian incremental gains over time. So over the course of the last... 30 years, both individually and concordantly for the last 20, we've developed a systematized approach for addressing these very complex dietary issues. And we have our little niche where we think that we do a really great job in that, in that area. It's beautiful, Wade. And uh, I, I want to say at the end of this episode that encouraging people to experiment is, I think, one of the healthiest, most supportive things you can do. And I'm glad you said that because we always encourage our listeners, our readers, the people that we coach, that life is just a series of never-ending experiments. And to move beyond sort of the dualistic thinking of success, failure, and just keep making experiments and just keep learning and evolving, we're so glad you share that same philosophy. And for the listener, 
We want you to make some experiments with bio-optimizers because Whitney and I are absolutely loving them, as we mentioned. So for you to make more life experiments, you can go to the show notes for this episode with Wade Lightheart at our website, which is wellevator.com. That's spelled W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. We will link to biooptimizers.com. That's spelled B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S, where you can download so much more incredible resource information that Wade has recorded and written and check out their entire lineup of products, again, that Whitney and I are absolutely loving incorporating into our daily health and fitness routine. So Wade, it, it has been just an absolute pleasure, again, watching your Facebook videos, your live videos over the years, and finally getting you on here to drop so many heartfelt nuggets of wisdom. You know, you you really do come from the heart. I can feel it in your words and feel it in your energy. And to have you as a leader in the nutrition and wellness field uh, is an absolute blessing. And thank you for blessing us with your presence here today. It's been a joy. Oh, thanks. I, I'm all, all choked up from all that stuff. I, I would just say that I was a guy too stupid or too stubborn to quit. And, uh, you know, after an, a massive series of failures in this kind of incremental mentality that we talked about, we were able to solve some problems for a, a large number of people. And I get to wake up every day and see those testimonials um, about people's lives that have changed. And that's there's really, if you want to find a way to connect to the human condition, when you can reach out and support somebody in their own journey and, and, and they in yours, that's where we find the commonality in the human condition. And I think that's a really beautiful thing for all of us. So thank you for having me. It's been great questions and I didn't feel uncomfortable at all in all the questions. So I don't know, I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> Just kidding. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, for those who are listening, I hope this was of value to you.